Hey guys, Ron here, and this is a Pokemon channel, so I'm not gonna explain what these games are to a bunch of people who I assume already know what Pokemon Legends Arceus is. This is purely about my experience and opinion of this game after playing for 50 hours. You need to know that I'm the type of fan that still really enjoys modern Pokemon, so this game didn't really need to prove anything to me other than whether or not a semi-open world Pokemon game could work. In order to judge this, my review is separated into four sections, gameplay, graphics, story, and music. Each has a different priority but contributes to the arbitrary score at the end of the video. Now I'm gonna be real with you guys, this is one of the most fun Pokemon games in existence, but its flaws are incredibly evident. It's probably the least controversial Pokemon game because a majority of people can agree on what makes this game unique and fun to play, while also acknowledging the obvious shortcomings. It's not my dream Pokemon game, but it's among my favorites for many reasons. Simply playing it instantly sucks you in. So let's begin this review with... The gameplay of Legends Arceus is where a majority of the praise has been directed to. It's what makes it one of the most fun Pokemon games to simply play. It's also the most different out of any other main series Pokemon game, so considering there are a lot of new mechanics, there are bound to be some misses among the hits. So before talking about the many positives, there were a few problems I personally had with the gameplay. The controls are completely different from any other Pokemon game, so even towards the end of my playthrough I was still pressing B when I wanted to run and throwing Pokeballs when I wanted to throw my Pokemon instead. I'm still accidentally pressing A in battle to switch Pokemon instead of ZR. While a lot of the mechanics were intuitive, the actual buttons I needed to press didn't come natural to me, so I wasn't pleased that the controls couldn't be changed. And at the end of the day, the menus themselves weren't impressive either. I don't like how there isn't a quick save button, even Brilliant Diamond had that. And the lack of an option for a minimap was disappointing, considering it was a slight hassle opening up the map every single time I wanted to know what direction I was going in. It's not like these input and UI problems are extremely detrimental, they're simply not optimized. But by far the most polished or at least refined and natural mechanic in the game is catching and battling Pokemon. I love how fluid throwing the ball feels, and I enjoy how visceral the impact is when it lands. It's incredibly quick and fun throwing out my Pokemon to collect items and do battle. This mechanic is why everybody's enjoying the game, and it's because it's something you can't advertise. The thing that makes this game instantly enjoyable needs to be experienced firsthand. It was really well executed. There are also many ways to catch Pokemon, like sneaking up on them and luring them in with food, and there are also so many manners in which a Pokemon can be encountered. Each Pokemon reacts in different ways. Some are friendly, some are shy, some are aggressive, some are near family or in hordes, some are chilling, some are sleeping, but the point is th they aren't just walking around like in Sword and Shield. It's objectively a step up. Once in battle, the addition of strong and agile style is very welcome. It does add some genuine strategy when it comes to catching Pokemon, like getting the HP down to red with a specific style, and god was it necessary to use these styles effectively in the final post-game battle. Overall, it was an unobstructive way to make battles slightly more realistic, while still accounting for Pokemon's turn-based appeal. The new status effects and weather conditions were also logical, and the move pool expansion idea is brilliant. Finally, we can relearn moves on the go. It's an underrated change that needs to stay. When it comes to actual battle, it's cool that you can move around and control the camera, but it doesn't serve any real purpose. I may be one of the few that actually prefers the dynamic camera of the other 3D Pokemon games, because they made the battles feel epic. Now the camera pretty much stays in an unartistic angle that makes the battle feel realistic, but less grand and cinematic. I think ideally, in the future, we can still be able to control the camera like in this game, but it should automatically give us some dynamic camera angles when we don't move for like 10 seconds or so. I like that battles are now all in set mode, but it's kinda countered by the terrible decision to make it so that your Pokemon only get experience at the end of battle. I understand the decision for one-on-one -on -one wild battles, but for horde battles and especially trainer battles, it sucks when a Pokemon of mine contributes so much in battle, even knocking out a majority of the opponent's Pokemon, but gets no experience because it faints. It's seriously not fun and partially ruins the gratification of winning some battles and training weaker mons. There are bigger and more explicit flaws in the game, but this is the mechanic that contributed to more frustration than any other aspect of the game. For example, we'll talk about the bad dialogue and subpar graphics, but those didn't really make the game less fun for me. This however did. But let's talk about the game's difficulty. I was mostly satisfied with how challenging the game was, the HP of Pokemon has been increased and it generally felt like wild Pokemon, even the low leveled ones, were formidable or at the very least some kind of nuisance. If I was battling a strong Pokemon, I would still have to be weary of any wild Paris. Trainer battles weren't necessarily nail biting, but I was surprised to actually see that every trainer used strong and agile styles. The actual AI was good, the only problem was that basically every trainer had very few Pokemon on their team. But the Pokemon themselves, no matter the battle format, were always intimidating. 
At night, I would be chased by Zubats and Ghost types. During the day, hordes of weaker Pokemon would amplify the intensity of Alpha battles, which are already fairly intimidating. Even if the actual gameplay was straightforward, psychologically, I always felt the pressure, which is exceptionally unique in Pokemon. Like, it's a genuine challenge to sneak up on an Alpha when a Paris is trying to kill you from behind. And let's not forget about the actual boss battles. Noble Pokemon are simple in concept. You throw bombs and attack when there's an opening. But I was surprised that at least for my skill level, each Noble Pokemon was more challenging than the last. I didn't lose to Cleavor, but I lost two times to the next Noble, then three times to the third and fourth Noble, and finally lost like six times to the final Noble Pokemon. This is incredibly rare in Pokemon, where each gym leader, for example, isn't necessarily more challenging than the last. And let's not even talk about the actual final boss battle during the postgame. I'll save that for the story portion of the review. For now, I can say one of my favorite challenges in the game was the race to acquire rare Pokemon and items during space-time distortions. Definitely a highlight of the game. It's a very sick mechanic that makes sense within the lore of the game. Farming items in general was actually pretty fun. I enjoyed crafting, and finding satchels was a neat mechanic. The merit point system was an innovative way of acquiring evolution items, and therefore receiving mods that are pretty tough to get in games like uh, BDSP. The whole bag space thing was pretty annoying in the beginning, but by the end it was pretty easy to work around it by purchasing more space and regularly putting your items in the box on expeditions or excursions. Pokedex research tasks were also pretty varied and unique among each Pokemon. And while it sounds like it was a hassle to some players, it really wasn't a hindrance at all for me. It didn't feel overwhelming and I wasn't slogging through the game trying to complete them. I was progressing through the game at my own pace without any negative repercussions. I never overleveled, even though I used more than 6 Pokemon, and and I never had to complete any research task in order to get to where I wanted to go. Exploring is quick. The maps are not small, but with the mounts you get along the way, it's honestly fun to quickly get from place to place. Like riding on a weird deer, jumping into water and instantly riding on a basculin, double jumping out of the water and calling your braviary, while gliding down into a mountain face and climbing up with Sneasler. Exploration is fun when you're trying to find Pokemon and farming specific items, but the rare rewards for exploring aren't special. The incentive of finding a rare alpha is good if you want to grind or catch one, but a bit dull if you don't. Wisps and Unknown are fine, but that's pretty much all you get when climbing up a mountain. TMs and held items would be pretty rewarding to find while exploring optional areas if they existed in the game. Even just cooler items to craft with would be welcomed, but that's not what you find when exploring, which is a bummer. The Pokemon themselves are lively, but the world isn't. So while all the flaws I've listed so far are relatively subjective, the following seems to be the most explicit shortcoming of this game. The graphics are what most fans of this game agree are the most unfavorable and least polished aspect of Pokemon Legends Arceus. The threshold for when a game's bad graphics start negatively affecting the gameplay is very subjective. One person can play a game with near-perfect gameplay but not enjoy themselves because the subpar visuals are too glaring, while another person could totally ignore the graphics and may only notice the times when the game looks good and therefore praise the art direction. They're all valid, especially when the game looks like this. The fact is, this is below the industry standard for a video game. I don't think Game Freak was lazy, they simply didn't have the time. I'm not here to debate who's to blame for the deadlines, but at the end of the day, most people would have bumped up their score when rating this game if the graphics were better, even if it generally didn't affect how fun it was to play. The problem is that even though the technical aspect is pretty bad, the art direction isn't that good either. They made a conscious decision to give this game a muted palette, but it doesn't work when the textures themselves are exceedingly low quality. Based on my own subjective view, the Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra have more vibrant and detailed textures and colors. I loved how the Sword and Shield DLCs looked, while in this game, I'd say only 20% of locations look somewhat impressive. They simply did the bare minimum when it comes to dressing the environment. The actual design of the terrain is fine, but it's rough around the edges. While I was totally satisfied with the scale of each location, it's hard to be impressed when things look pretty bad from afar. The draw distance for the Pokemon themselves is definitively way better than in Sword and Shield, but the actual overworld is off awfully unimpressive when looking at it from up high. The water textures are not acceptable, and the caves look like they were made in a day. It's not immersion breaking for me. I know this is a game. I didn't come into this thinking I was going to see realistic landscapes. But it's just a shame when this kind of game would be much more enjoyable with at the very least the art direction of the Crown Tundra. There are locations that did shine above the rest. I love the Heartwood. It's the only place that is kind of on par with Breath of the Wild's woods. It does feel like an actual lush forest. The trees, river, hills, and lighting are well designed. Jubilife Village has some pretty good lighting at night too. 
The ancient quarry is very interesting for a longtime Pokemon fan with its uh, riveting ruins, and the ice caves definitely look better than places like Wayward Cave. It's got a chill vibe. And the only two locations that met my expectations of what a Gen 8 Sinnoh game would look like are Snowpoint Temple and the Temple of Sinnoh. It really feels like this is what we expected Sinnoh remakes to look like. If I showed a fan from 2020 a screenshot of Snowpoint Temple, they'd be excited. The animation of the Pokemon themselves is pretty great too. The new move animations and how they're executed are exactly what people wanted from modern Pokemon games. Pokemon actually move forward and flamethrowers are shot from the mouth. The human animation in this game is a step down though from Sword and Shield in my opinion. People in Galar were walking around while everybody stands still in uh, Jubilife. But I'm beyond satisfied with the character animation during these amazing cutscenes, which brings me to... The story in this game has gotten a mixed reception and I think I know why. So right from the beginning, the hook is compelling. Time travel is always wicked and you get to test out the throwing mechanic in the first few minutes at some of the most adorable Pokemon in the game. But then you enter probably my least favorite tutorial section in Pokemon. Yeah, I enjoyed the Sun and Moon tutorial a bit more. It sucks because it's a very bad first impression for those who haven't played a Pokemon game in a while. They don't care about the lore of Pokemon and because of that they'll begin to button mash through dialogue even when it gets interesting. As a hardcore Pokemon fan there was a lot of fan service, easter eggs and references that I wholeheartedly enjoyed. But I would agree that the dialogue in this game is rather slow and repetitive. Even when they say something interesting they say it in a long winded way and repeat it. But it usually leads to something fun. I'm a fan of the whole narrative of frenzied noble Pokemon and I willingly completed a lot of the quests in the game. They range from a bit tedious to kind of fun. It's a majorly inoffensive part of the game, so I'd say it was a successful element. I'm a huge fan of how you get to see Jubilife grow somewhat as you play the game, but the climax is hard to rate. As it began, I was very interested in our banishment and the walk of shame we had to perform was brutal, but then all the steps we had to go through to get to the final battles felt a bit contrived. The answers to each dilemma didn't feel like they were naturally answered, and I personally wasn't on board with the decision to include 30 minutes of dialogue with very minimal battling. At least in other Pokemon games, when the climax isn't narratively compelling, you get to battle a lot of trainers, but all that transpired at the Temple of Sinnoh was pretty epic. I'm a big fan of biblically accurate Dialga and Palkia. I admire the idea that these two look more like Arceus in their origin form and are difficult to comprehend, but it was an odd choice to roll the credits after our battle at the summit when the real antagonist and answers to all of our questions are in the post game. For Pokemon fans who play through the post game story, they're greeted with an amazingly satisfying final battle, one of the most fulfilling and well executed antagonists and final bosses in all of Pokemon. I lost many times to Giratina and having it change forms right as I subdued it was incredibly memorable. Everything came together amazingly well, but it's a huge shame that I've seen multiple streamers who aren't well versed in Pokemon's gameplay simply not play the post game. They enjoyed the game a great deal, but thought it was over after the credits and were left unsatisfied by the story because all the big questions questions weren't answered during the climax. It's an odd choice when the plot of the game doesn't make full sense until the post game. But as a Pokemon fan, I really enjoyed the characters. All their designs were right up my alley. I think Kamado was well handled even during the banishment and appreciated a character that wasn't so cheerful all the time, just like Silene who was unexpectedly wholesome with a mix of pragmatism. I played as Rei, so Akari's facial expressions were my favorite in the game. Adaman is probably the coolest character in the game and I think my favorite male design in Pokemon, though Irida's characterization and tail was more compelling than his. I felt for her. All of the wardens except for Meli had appealing personalities and designs. Arezu, Mai, and Paulina are top tier. I gotta tell you, good job on that. But Ingo, oh my god. So when you're trapped in an unfamiliar world, it's so refreshing and comforting to see a familiar face, especially when it's one you took for granted. Ingo's story is so interesting to me as a fan of Pokemon. I was happily surprised by his inclusion in the game, and Benny's twist design and the reveal that he was Wally's ancestor was one of my favorite moments in the game. And I gotta say, I'm a fan of the Misfortune Sisters. They look great, and the soft confirmation that Charm may be the ancestor of both Bertha and Agatha through her two Pokemon is pretty clever. Although I really like how Candace's ancestor is the angriest character in all of Pokemon, which is the opposite of Candace's chill personality. But spoiler alert. Bolo was a terrific twist villain. I was spoiled ahead of time, but he was admittedly pretty sus, so I wasn't surprised by his heel turn, but was definitely surprised to find out his motivations and the fact that he caused the rift in space time. The imagery with him beside Giratina is one of my favorite visuals in the entire franchise, not to mention the music. Actually, let's mention it. You know me, I'm a Pokemon music simp and this soundtrack is no exception. The music in this game is very special. It's unique because the majority of it's ambient and atmospheric, but the battle music goes extremely hard. There is so much fan service for people like me who've memorized every theme in Sinnoh, and a majority of the music in this game references the original soundtrack. It's a shame that there are a lot of silent points in the game, cause when the music begins to play, I'm vibing. 
until a Pokemon spots me. It sucks to have many tracks I rarely get to fully listen to in game. I love every theme in Legends Arceus, and there is a 60% chance I'm making a top 10 video for the soundtrack, so I don't want to talk about it in depth, but here are the ones that positively affected my playthrough and actively contributed to my enjoyment of this game. The Warden battle music is such an underrated take on the gym leader theme, it's such a strong melody, so it's fun to hear it arranged with different instruments. When I entered the Heartwood, I was completely on board with the subtle homage to Eternal Forest, but then when it literally became Eternal Forest theme, I was elated. It was a highlight of my playthrough, definitely contributed to the Heartwood being my favorite place in the game. At the beginning of the story, I was confused as to why Game Freak decided to make Jubilee Village's theme so minimal and short. Why would the most important location have the worst theme? But I was completely surprised and embarrassed of my doubt when the village's theme evolved as it developed and slowly became Jubilee City's theme by the end. Another unforgettable moment. Cobalt Coastland's themes are melodically some of my favorite tracks in the game. Now the late night music is the first theme in the game that I gave a 10 out of 10 right as I heard it. It perfectly fit the mood and introduced me to one of the game's best original melodies. It's unforgettable. The lake theme, just like the Heartwoods theme, was the one I was anticipating the most, and they definitely delivered. The lake's themes felt so ethereal and otherworldly, way more divine than their original theme. The Mount Cornet theme in this game is what I wanted it to be in BDSP. I'm completely satisfied and have fallen in love with it all over again. But damn, contending for my favorite theme in the game is the battle with Origin Form Dialga and Palkia. Not only is it an amazing remix of their original theme, but also like the first ever Eurobeat theme in Pokemon. I think it's never been done before, so when you hear it in this game, contrasting with the traditional music of the rest of the soundtrack, it's incredibly uncanny and almost intimidating. It sounds like the future in a game that takes place in the past. It was overwhelming when I heard it. The credit music is fantastic, I'm sure we're all fans of Route 209, and I'm glad Game Freak knows what tracks we all wanted to hear in this game. And now, for the spoiler-filled final boss battle music. It's beautiful. Volo's theme is a more serene version of Cynthia's theme and battle music that is more triumphant and angelic sounding at times while including more chilling sections. I still prefer Cynthia's normal battle theme. But the origin form Giratina theme in this game is wild. How did they manage to make an extremely intimidating theme sound even more hardcore and legendary? Also one of my favorite themes in this game. Overall, another Pokemon soundtrack that did not disappoint. Ultimately, Pokemon Legends Arceus is both incomplete and incredibly fun. It's possible to be both. As a Pokemon game, it's a 9.5 out of 10. But when thinking about it objectively as a game, it's a 7.5 out of 10, which is great, that's a good game. And it's probably the least controversial Pokemon game because a majority of people can agree on what makes this game unique and fun to play, while also acknowledging the obvious flaws. This is one of the few Pokemon games I would recommend to anyone. It recaptures the magic of this franchise, and as a fan of the existing main series formula, it's not my ideal Pokemon game since we all can agree that Pokemon's formula of going on a journey to become a Pokemon champion has never been perfected in the 3D era of Pokemon, so I wouldn't abandon it for Pokemon Legends, but rather marry the two formats and create a game with way more trainer battles, items, abilities, and towns, while giving us an open world with Pokemon to catch in real time. Over the last few weeks, Legends Arceus has become one of my top 3 favorite Pokemon games. It's definitely the Pokemon game I'm compelled to constantly play the most. It's a very good indication of what Pokemon can become in the future. They gave us a taste of what we've been dreaming of for years, and have ushered in a new era of Pokemon. 